Hello, um, my name is Rafi Khan. I'm a grade 10 teacher, math teacher here at Philman Wright. I've been teaching here for about 20 years. I'm on the screen right now. You see my email address is there in case you need to get a hold of me for anything. So this, uh, the purpose of this video is to inform, I guess, parents and teacher, or sorry, parents and students, uh, just some general information. I use this as sort of my meet the teacher type of video for those people that weren't able to make it to the physical meeting. Uh, it also helps for students that are starting late or just parents that want a little bit more information as their child starts the year. Um, just a quick picture of my classroom, just so you can uh, locate yourself in the space that we have here in school. Um, you can see that there's no smart board in my classroom. Um, I'm in sort of an old school type teacher. And I use my blackboard constantly. I teach lessons at the same pace that students uh, write it. Um, yeah, so there's the physical space. Um, so we've got three terms this year. We're back to three terms. Uh, the topics themselves are not really as important as just the, the fundamental premise that this course, this grade 10 science math course, is very, very much heavy on the algebra learning. So we develop the skills that, uh, sorry, we further develop skills that students were taught back in grade eight and grade nine. And it is a very much a heavy, heavy algebra course. So the first term and the second term are pretty much all algebra. And then even into the third term, when we switch into geometry and switch into statistics, there's still a large algebra component uh, with the geometry and the statistics. Evaluations, uh, homework is done on a daily basis. I'm looking for completeness, not correctness. So you should be seeing homework being done every single day by your child. If you don't see it, it's either because maybe they're doing it like at school at lunch perhaps, or after school. Um, we do not have time during class to actually complete homework because our classes are so jam packed. So if you're not seeing it, that's possible just because they're doing it outside of uh, their house. Uh, it's also possible that they're just not doing it, simply put. Weekly quizzes uh, and monthly tests are also evaluation tools that are used. Um, and over the course of the year, we'll have some situational problems as well. Uh, this year, we will have a mid-year exam in February, the first week of February. And we have a couple of final exams at the end of the year in June. This pie chart, um, and actually all the information that's being shared to you right now is on the course outline that was shared with students on day one of the school year. This pie chart just gives you an idea of sort of the overall weightings for everything that we do over the course of the year. Uh, term one you can see is in blue, it's the smallest pieces of the pie. Term two is in green. Uh, term three, you can see, is by far the largest piece. It's pretty much half of the pie there, in red. And then the final exams are in purple in the top left corner. Okay, so really the important stuff, I guess, is what you need to know. Uh, the course is intended for the top 30% of students uh, who plan on pursuing math and science after high school. So basically, students who take this course plan on continuing moving forward with math and sciences, maybe into engineering, maybe into pure sciences of some manner, uh, perhaps even into sort of the commerce side of uh, math, accounting, uh, accounting and, and business and whatnot. But fundamentally, there needs to be some type of enjoyment. Students who take the course, for sure, in a lot of cases, uh, are doing it to keep their doors open, but there should be some part of them that actually enjoys doing the math, especially at this level. A prerequisite mark of 75% is required for the course. Um, it's actually not a steadfast rule. There's about 110 students in the course right now, and about 20 of them actually didn't meet this requirement, but are still uh, allowed to take the course. Um, so that's why we oftentimes see students struggle is because they didn't really meet the recommendation to come into the course, but they decided to take it anyway. Uh, so yeah, um, students can also come to the grade 10 science math course coming from grade 10 cultural math. They used to be a more popular path pathway, but it's no longer all that common. I think I've got about grade, maybe six or seven grade 11 students in the course this year. So at this level, the math is difficult and abstract. Um, there's definitely a big step up coming from grade eight and grade nine math. It's not as tangible, it's not as concrete. It doesn't necessarily lend to day-to-day -day life like other or more basic levels of math do. Um, and actually, it serves as a building block um, for further education in math. So students that eventually will go into linear programming, into calculus, into higher levels of math, this is sort of where that, that extra higher learning starts is at a course like this. So it is definitely much more abstract. 
There is lots of material and the course is fast paced. I'll give you an example. Um, in previous years, I've also taught the grade 10 cultural course. In a grade 10 cultural course, we might learn a concept on a Monday, practice it all week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with the same type of repetition, and then maybe quiz on it on a Friday. Whereas in science math, we might have a new topic on a Monday, a new topic on a Tuesday, a new topic on a Wednesday, some practice on a Thursday, and then a test on the, or a quiz on a Friday. It is very dense. There's a lot of content that we have to cover. We cover, well, I would say roughly about twice as much content as the grade 10 cultural math course. And unlike maybe previous years, it's not simply just memorization of formulas and rote learning. The more practice you do, you can just sort of understand questions just by following patterns. That's not necessarily the case at this level. Um, oftentimes I use examples of, you know, the concepts that we, the concepts that we learn, uh, we might learn, you know, concept A, concept B, and concept C, but by the end of uh, a, a unit, we might have to synthesize and adapt knowledge uh, in new scenarios. So students really are required to understand what they're doing, not just uh, do it out of sort of memory or practice. Students must be engaged, motivated, and willing to ask for help. Um, not a lot I could say there. It's just it, this course is very difficult for students that are not really into it. Um, I mean, that's really one of the reasons why we have Great Ten Culture Math as well. Now, don't get me wrong. Part of my job is also to ensure that kids do stay engaged and motivated, and I, I try to give as much as many strategies over the course of the year in order to do that. But the willingness to ask for help really has to come to, from the student themselves. I make it really easy, and hopefully, uh, the help is very accessible. Um, here at Philman for grade 10 science math students. But students are really required to sort of get out of their own individual bubble. They have to be willing to, to seek that support. So oftentimes in the past, a lot of students can get away with learning stuff on their own uh, and just figuring it out uh, through maybe even trial and error. But at a course like this, really students are going to be required at some point, maybe even all year, to ask for help. That help could come from a friend. The help could come from a family member. Could help could come from a private tutor. In a lot of the easiest cases, it really can just come from myself as a teacher. So students really should be able to reach out for that help uh, as needed. Success requires the right balance of ability and effort. So this is kind of, you can imagine uh, it's a, a nice balancing act for students. The stronger the student's ability, they can get away with doing a little less work maybe not as much as the student beside them. But students who maybe struggle a little bit more at math, it doesn't come as naturally, um, they can still succeed, but they have to be willing to put the effort in. And oftentimes it just comes from sheer volume of practice and volume of work that those students can find a way through and, and succeed. Our success rates in this school are very, very good, regardless of how difficult the year is um, in actual sort of results and marks, student success by the end of the year is typically sort of in the 95% or so range. We do much better in this school than we, uh, than typically other schools and even um, probably some of the uh, private schools as well. Students have a difficult time adjusting at the start of the year. So you'll typically see this and students really see this. And we have lots of conversations in class about this. In fact, right now, it's almost like a daily conversation. And over the course of the year, we'll continue to have these conversations, how the adjustment for this year can be for some students very, uh, very difficult. There's a steep learning curve because not only do they have to figure out the math, but they also have to figure out strategies on how to learn, how to be more effective students. And again, I, these are some of the things that we talk about in class, but for some students, they just need a little bit more time. So oftentimes we'll see term one results fairly low and term two results fairly low. And then mid-year exam results can be sort of where some students bottom out. And then after about half of the year, the second half of the year, things start to get better. Students realize all the things that they knew, need to do in order to succeed, and we finish the year strong. So there's a class website, um, mathtastic.ca. The students have been shown this at school. Um, and I have encouraged them to sort of just peruse it on their own. And I've been sort of going through some links with them uh, in class as well to show them where they can find all the stuff. I am not using Microsoft Teams. Um, everything is through the class website at mathtastic.ca. And this is just really something that I've been developing over the last 20 years and adding resources. So the single most important thing on the website is that there is a calendar 
that the students can access so that they can see what they're doing on any given day. Uh, so if they miss days because they're sick or if they're missed days because they're on vacation or whatever the case, um, they can always go back to that click clickable calendar, find out what they missed. They can also see what they have coming up. I typically post one term at a time, but I'm very organized. Uh, if a student wants to know what they're doing on May 2nd, I can tell them what we're, what we're doing on May 2nd. That clickable calendar also has, by definition, links that are clickable, and they can click on videos. Uh, every lesson this year, all 83 lessons have been previously recorded in prior, prior, uh, prior years. And uh, there's a YouTube channel where I've recorded myself teaching classes and all that stuff is accessible online. Um, there's practice questions that are on the clickable calendar. There's homework um, that's accessible there as well. And so yeah, that clickable calendar is probably the number one resource that students use to stay on top of their work if they need to. Of course, we do everything in class. So everything else here on the website is just extra. Uh, individual student marks are also on the website, not by student name, but by a uh, random ID number. You can ask your child or the student should know their ID number. You can also uh, you know, contact me and I'll, I'm happy to give that to you. Um, there's a Google Drive as well, a public Google, Google Drive that has access to, I think there's about a thousand files there. Uh, again, I've been doing this course a long time and I don't reuse my evaluation. So everything that I use from one year becomes a resource for uh, the next year. So there's lots and lots and lots of practice there. Uh, at times it can be a little overwhelming and that's why oftentimes I just tell students to look at the clickable calendar instead. The course outline is there. There's extra resources that, that are there as well. Links to Khan Academy information, extra practice worksheets. There's a whole lot of stuff. Extra help is also available on day two, four, five, and six is at lunch. Um, I see students every single day. There's not a single day that we, we don't have math. So it's every single day of the cycle. Um, I'm not available on day one because I'm on duty and I'm not available on day three either. But day two, four, five, and six are the days that I will be in my room at lunch. Uh, and yeah, students are definitely encouraged to come in. They can bring in their lunch. I've got a microwave. They can heat it up. They can come and socialize with their friends. As long as they're still being productive, um, then it's really not a problem. It's a safe space for them to, uh, to come and ask for help when they need it. Uh, some students will just sort of come in pretty much every day all year. Some students will pick and choose the days. Oftentimes, you hear the myth, uh, it's too busy at lunch. I can't get help. Well, it tends to happen like the day before a test or the day before a quiz. It can get really busy. Students that wait until the last second to get that support, yeah, they may be stuck in a line to ask for questions, but uh, I really encourage students as questions come up on a day-to-day -day basis to get that support immediately as opposed to waiting. And that's it. Thank you very much.